Well, brethren, as we come to this last day of this module, I trust you with me are inclined to give much thanks to God for all the ways we've seen his good hand upon us, taking a tipsy, topsy-turvy preacher that had to be held up by this pulpit in that first lecture or two and reinvigorating me as we've moved along and giving us a sense of God's presence. But we have not exhausted our need, nor has he exhausted his grace. So let's come to him again, praying for that grace to be upon us today. Our Father, you have told us that it is a good thing to give thanks to you, to show forth your faithfulness, your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. And so we do celebrate your loving kindness to us this morning. As we look back over the several days together, you have been abundantly kind and gracious to us. We thank you for hearing all of our prayers and restoring my ability to stand stable and without headiness and dizziness and the vertigo that I might be able to deliver the material that you have helped me to put together for this particular unit. Thank you for keeping each of the men healthy, for pervading our time together with a spirit of genuine Christian love, mutual forbearance and godly deference one to another, each considering other better than himself. Father, what a privilege to be in a setting where we've experienced so much of the concentrated manifestation of your goodness and of your grace. But we come this morning again as needy men and we do not presume that because we have known that blessing in the past, it will automatically be ours today. But we come with our empty cups and we hold them up and say, Lord, fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit, with holy wisdom, with holy discernment, with holy understanding in your truth. And bless this hour with your presence and your grace. We plead in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, as we continue our consideration of this vital aspect of what I've chosen to call individual pastoral care of the people of God, let me briefly remind you of the ground that we've already covered. We began by establishing the necessity for pastoral counseling. We then went on to focus our attention on the relative priority of pastoral counseling. And then from there, we examined the setting of pastoral counseling, the goal of that counsel, and then a suggested method for pastoral counsel. Then we spent several lectures focusing on the all-important issues of the presuppositional framework or foundation for pastoral counseling. And then in the last several lectures, we've been working through what I have set before you under the title, Specific Guidelines for Pastoral Counseling. I've indicated that in broad terms, we are following what we might call a medical model as the physician of souls. And with that model as our framework, we've considered thus far those guidelines as they relate to two major areas of concern. The first was before the session or sessions, and secondly, during the session or sessions. We now move to the third major area of these specific guidelines, that which I've entitled as assessing progress and steadfastness of resolution. I have two things I want to say by way of introductory perspectives, and the first is this. When we engage in this matter of assessing progress and steadfastness of resolution, 
the assumption is that the particular sheep you are counseling or the couple you are counseling is or are being honest with you in your follow-up interaction with him or with them. However, that's not always true. And all you can do is simply charge the man or woman or the couple with their responsibility to be honest with you as you seek to help them in whatever problems, sins, abnormalities that have brought them to you for seasons of specific counsel. If it is a matter of real serious sin, which they might seek to hide out of shame or fear of church discipline, I have found that it does not hurt to remind them not only of a text like Proverbs 28, 13, he that covers his sin shall not prosper, but only he who confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy, but even to take them to Acts and to show them what God did to Ananias and Sapphira when they deliberately lied to Peter as Christ's representative in the church and say, my brother, my sister, I don't in any way wish that God would do something like striking you dead, but he takes very seriously your honesty in dealing with the servants of God who are seeking to help you to come to greater maturity in Jesus Christ. So I lovingly charge you to be brutally honest with me as we try to assess whether or not we are making progress in addressing the concern. It is at this point that it could be, I'm not saying it must be, but it could be judicious to say, I'm charging you so seriously in this because I know my own heart. And I know what it's like to be in situations where I am accountable to others for issues in my own life and how I have personally been tempted to shave the truth, to shape it in something less than its real configuration, not a blatant lie, but a twisting of the issues. And knowing that temptation in my own heart, I can understand that you too might be tempted and that sometimes helps them to realize that I really have no necessity to succumb to the temptation of dishonesty. Someone is here remembering, here's our presupposition, I too am not only a man, I'm a sinful man. I could be tempted to dishonesty with someone asking me how I was doing in a given area of spiritual need or weakness. And then the second introductory perspective is this. I remind you again that the suggested directives or guidelines cannot be treated as airtight compartments of interaction with living individual human beings. In those cases where you're engaged in a series of counseling sessions, you will most likely be continually following through with general guidelines that you initially used, but you'll have to include this matter of seeking to assess progress and steadfastness of resolution. Over the years, I've often quoted what was reported to me as the words of an old Methodist minister to one of his sheep. And those words, reported as the words of an old Methodist minister, were these. There is only one thing better than getting right, and that's keeping right. Now, whether an old Methodist minister said it or not, this old Baptist preacher is saying it. I think it's a good little aphorism. Only one thing better than getting right, and that's staying right. And surely that was the great burden in the apostolic counsel to the churches. Paul has been seeking to break through uh, the fog of theological thinking about the law and the grace of God in Christ. And he spends that whole epistle seeking to bring the Galatians back to their fundamental gospel foundation. And when he comes to chapter 5, 
He says to them, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free. Be not entangled again in a yoke of bondage. He's affirming that he believes God has made his instruction effectual, but he's a realist and he acknowledges they could go back to where they were. And so he exhorts them to stand fast in that liberty wherewith Christ has made them free. And then again in Hebrew, in Ephesians chapter 6, we have a similar emphasis when writing to the Ephesians concerning the spiritual conflict with principalities and powers. He says in verses 13 and 14a, Wherefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore. Here we're not called to go forward, but to maintain the ground gained and to be established in the truth of God. And nothing makes the heart of a true servant of God more delighted when he sees that people are standing fast in the progress made and we should convey to our people, John and Mary, I can't tell you what gladness you've brought by sharing with me that God is enabling you to stand your ground in the progress made. An example of this is Colossians chapter 2 and verse 5. He says, For though I am absent in the flesh, I am with you in the Spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in, our, in faith in Christ. He lets them know by letter, I've had an accurate report that you are standing fast and it fills me with joy. And the similar emphasis of 3 John verses 3 and 4, familiar words where John concludes them by saying, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Now, for the sake of organizational clarity, we're going to treat this matter of assessing progress and resolution in two natural categories. First, assessing progress while engaged in ongoing intensive counseling and assuming that the counseling sessions have come to an end, assessing steadfastness in the apparent resolution of the problem subsequent to the counseling sessions. So we take up the first, assessing progress while engaged in ongoing intensive counseling. Since you are not engaged in merely putting band-aids on spiritual and moral problems, or simply seeking to meet someone's psychological need for special attention and empathetic, sympathetic interaction with a problem, it is crucial that somewhere close to the beginning of a follow-up session with the individual or couple, you make a conscious effort to come to an accurate assessment of their progress in dealing with the problem. Is there indeed real change of attitude, behavior, and increasing conformity to biblical norms. This you must seek to ascertain. And you can do this by the judicious use primarily of certain questions. Several questions you can ask in pursuit of attaining this measure of progress. I suggest three categories of questions. Category one, is the patient taking the medicine? In your previous session, having identified the area of need, perhaps it was the wife who needs to learn to think before she speaks and responds to what may be a less than tactful directive from her husband. She's acknowledged that she's snippy and short in her responses and you've brought biblical text to bear upon being swift to hear, slow to speak, let no corrupt speech proceed out of your mouth. 
You've taken her to some of the passages on gentle and gracious speech in the book of Proverbs, and now you're going to assess progress. Is the patient taking the medicine? And you say to that individual, have you been reading, praying over, meditating upon the passages of Scripture that I gave you in that previous session? Well, if the person says, well, really, no, I've not been taking the medicine, then you want to press the issue, why have you not been taking it? And if it becomes plain that they are just plain spiritually lazy and unwilling for the personal discipline necessary to implement the counsel given, then you may need to digress and give them a brief Bible study on what the Scripture says concerning the sluggard, the indolent, and the lazy. And I left you a whole string of verses out of the book of Proverbs that you could use. And you say, Mary, what I've heard you say is you are being guilty of spiritual laziness. You have not said there's absolutely no time in my daily schedule to follow the counsel, get alone with God for 15 minutes, take one of these texts each day, pray them in, meditate upon them, consider how they should influence the way I respond to John. You're being spiritually lazy. And God has a lot to say about spiritual laziness. And then you take her to those passages. And then you remind them again of James 4, 17, to him that knows to do good, and does it not, to him it is sin. Your refusal to take the time to ingest the medicine is sin. You know you ought to. Your conscience is persuaded of your duty. You're not fulfilling your duty. You're adding sin to sin. Or if they're not taking the medicine, it may be again an aspect of not fully understanding how we are to engage ourselves in the process of spiritual growth. They may have been influenced by some kind of deeper life passivity, let go, let God. Then you take them to Philippians 2, 12 and 13. They are to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. Or 2 Corinthians 7, 1, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves of all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So the first group of questions you're seeking to ascertain, is the patient taking the medicine? The second, is the medicine working? It is at this point you may have to help the individual with whom you are counseling to make an accurate answer to that question. Sometimes it is very difficult for a person to really know whether they are or are not making progress. I have found it helpful to ask questions along these lines. First, the frequency of falls into the particular sin which is the focus of your counseling. Urge them to keep some kind of a record of the times when they fall into the kinds of sins that can be recorded in this way. Such sins as gossiping, skipping devotions, crippling depressive periods, masturbation, excessive television watching, viewing pornography, overeating, skipping planned exercise times, those kinds of things that don't demand some deep penetrating incident to know whether you've done them or not. I found that a period in my life when I was struggling with a particular sin that one of the most helpful means God used, I determined I, I operate uh, with an old flat desk calendar with the big blocks a month at a time. I'm too old to change. I'll never be there having my schedule with an electronic device. It sits in my left hand drawer at my desk and my life is mapped out there. And I determined I would make a little red tick mark 
in the upper right-hand corner of any day when I consciously fell into that sin. And just having to look at red check marks that I couldn't rationalize. I couldn't say, well, you know, I've gone good, you know, probably three, four weeks without falling. Over. I look and there's four check marks. It's forcing me to see the depth of the struggle with this issue, that it's not going on its own. It's not going easily. But it was that keeping in touch with reality that was a great factor in eventually bringing me to the place where I no longer needed to make check marks and can say by the grace of God, though I know I could revert to that area of weakness any given day, that is a chapter that God's grace has put behind me. And I can say in union with Christ, I am more than conqueror through him that loved me. So I leave that as a suggestion as you seek to assess the progress. Further, help them to properly assess the intensity of their falls. Some people feel that every fall is a fall is a fall. But sometimes they fall five feet, sometimes 10, some 25. Help them to assess the intensity of the fall and then encourage them to track the length of time before they get back into the way of gospel forgiveness and gospel obedience. And often this can unlock the door of hope where they've struggled with something for so long and internally they really despair. Will I ever be able to conquer this sin, master this area of duty, become consistent in this area of my life? If they can see, look, God is at work. The frequency of your falls are less, the intensity is less, and the period of rebound is shorter when you're back on track. And then you can encourage them that God who has helped them to make this much progress can carry them further. So we ask the question, are they taking the medicine? And a few suggestions as to how we can discern that. And then is the medicine working? Thirdly, if the medicine is not working, seek to help them to discover why this is so. Maybe they're taking the verses you've given them and praying over them, meditating upon them, but they're not seeing any substantive change. Well, then you have to ask as the physician of souls, am I giving them the right medicine? And then you pray, God, give me wisdom. If I'm not applying the right medicine, teach me that I might know what is the proper spiritual medicine for this needy sheep. And though it's not speaking directly of this matter, the principle is there in that 2 Timothy 2 passage that the servant of the Lord must not be argumentative, he must not strive, but be gentle to all men, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth. It may not be the right medicine and you need to patiently work with the individual seeking to discover what is. Further, you can ask, is the problem that there's a subtle and carnal confidence in the medicine? Have they begun to apply it with a penny in the slot syndrome in their own thinking? And if so, verses I've quoted again and again in this series of lectures, Jeremiah 17, 5 to 9, Cursed be the man who trusts in man. Trusting in the best medicine rather than trusting in God to make the medicine effective will have God's curse upon it. And then John 15, 1 to 8, We must abide in Christ and draw grace from Christ if we are to know the working of Christ in further spiritual maturation. And then we need to ask, is the Holy Spirit applying the medicine? We may have the right medicine. People may think they are not carnally confident in the medicine, 
But is there any evidence that the Holy Spirit is actually applying it? And if not, could it be? It's a clay case of you have not because you ask not. In spite of God's promise, Luke 11, 13, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit? They are not specifically, explicitly, persistently praying for the intervening and powerful application of the Spirit's work to the medicine. And here I recommend J. Adams in the Christian Counselor's Manual, pages 459 to 461, for a list of 50 reasons why our counsel may not be producing evident fruit. And you may find in any given individual, when you've reached that uh, judgment that the medicine's not working, going to that section saying, Lord, could it be this, this? No, not that, not that. Oh, possibly that. Oh, I think that may be. So I reference that, that they may be helpful to you in a given circumstance. Furthermore, when the medicine does not seem to be working, this may be a call for you to seek counsel and help from others as you prayerfully seek to know why the medicine's not working. As we said the other day, earthly physicians continually consult with one another in order to learn from one another insights gained in the actual practice of medicine. And sometimes seeking help from a brother, he may just say, and it's God's means, brother, if you'd asked me that three weeks ago, I wouldn't have a clue how to respond. But in the providence of God, I've just come through an intense counseling session with someone with a similar problem. And though we made no progress taking this approach, that approach, when we took this approach, God used it to break the back. Now, that doesn't mean he will necessarily use it in your case, but it could be that God would. And this way, you gain wisdom by seeking counsel. Well, then we come, secondly, to assessing steadfastness in the apparent resolution of the problem or problems. It is at this point that we see afresh the wonderful privilege of carrying out the vast majority of our individual counseling labors in the context of the total life and ministry of the church. When the person we're counseling came to us in the midst of a personal or domestic crisis, we took on the task of seeking to help them with the vision that with God's blessing upon our labors, the time would come when this individual or this couple could be released back into the mainstream life and ministry of the church without the necessity for ongoing special individual counseling sessions. However, I trust we do not believe in any form of perfectionism we know from the scriptures and our own spiritual experience that ground that has been gained can be lost again for various reasons. Furthermore, when the fundamental problem has been resolved, it does not mean that there cannot be further progress in that area of spiritual development. Two key texts, 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Wherefore, let him who thinks he stands, I've made progress, this sin is behind me, I'm immune from any temptation to it. Let him who thinks he stands, take heed, lest he fall. I realize that just sticking my neck out and giving you that biographical example of the tick marks on my calendar, and I'm not even sure I can remember what the issue was, but I'm quite certain I will remember very soon after this lecture when the enemy will tempt me in that very area. And I have no foolish notion that because there are no more red tick marks on my desk calendar, I'm immune from falling back into something that once plagued me. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. 
And then if it's been a breakthrough in the cultivation of a given grace, if Mary has begun to be gracious now instead of snappy when her husband speaks to her, 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 and 10, Paul says concerning brotherly love, I don't need to write anything. You yourselves are taught of God to love one another, but I exhort you to abound yet more and more. So that we say to Mary, Mary, it's wonderful. You no longer will have the reputation of being a snippy wife. Let's aim to where you will gain the reputation of being an exemplary, gracious wife. Let's go to the maximum of what the grace of God can produce in your life. Therefore, in the light of these things, you should establish some method of determining whether or not people are standing in the liberty wherewith Christ has made them free. I have found it helpful through the years to do this by establishing specific code language with the individual or the couple in order to assess their ongoing steadfastness in resolution of the problem. For example, a couple comes and says, look, the elders, my parents, all the proper people involved have encouraged us to pursue our relationship headed toward marriage. They've made a formal commitment and engagement and they've come to you in spite of the clear instructions you've given them. And they've said, Pastor, we're really having a problem keeping our hands off one another. We're struggling with maintaining moral purity. And you counsel them and you give them some very practical principles. And here, brethren, just don't be overly fastidious. I tell couples, look. It's a simple little rule, four on the floor and an open door. Simple little thing. I told that to my own children. Couples can't fornicate with four feet on the floor unless they're some kind of contortionist. And an open door, that means anyone at any time can walk by and see what you're doing. Four on the floor and an open door. That's just a little aside. But I usually establish code language and say something like this. Now, John and Mary, when you go out my door and don't you avoid me, you normally do, don't you avoid me or you, I'm going to suspect that you're messing around where you shouldn't. And where in the presence of 15, 20 people, I just innocently shake your hand, give you a little hug, embrace, peck on the cheek, and I say, how are things going? That's code language. Things is the things we've talked about in this session. And I want you to be honest with me. And if you're struggling again, I want you to say in code language, they could be better or not so well. And then I know I need to get on the phone and say, we need another counseling session. You are monitoring steadfastness in resolution of the issue. And you can develop your own little code language with people so that growing out of your normal pastoral interaction, you can be faithful to monitor steadfastness in progress. Further, you should urge the church member to take the initiative in letting you know from time to time how he or she or they are doing with the problem. Urge them not to allow the issue to become one that rises to a crisis level again before they communicate with you. And one of the texts that I hope you men will preach and apply specifically with your people is Galatians 6.6. 6. Let him who is taught in the word communicate to him who teaches in every good thing. And what's one of the goodest of the good things they can communicate to you. Pastor, by the grace of God, Mary and I are maintaining our purity. Thank you for your investment of time and energy in our lives. Thank you for your questioning at the door. Urge your people to take the initiative to tell you how and in what ways they've profited from your ministry, both publicly and privately. It doesn't cost anything 
to take a moment at the door and put a hand on the shoulder and to communicate to you that by the grace of God, they are standing firm in the resolution of the issue. Another little technique I found helpful in your commitment to pray regularly for your people, use the occasion of praying for that individual or couple to give them a telephone call assuring them you've been praying for them and ask them for an update. John, Mary, or John and Harry, uh, in the course of praying through the directory, I was praying for you this morning and in praying for you, I could not help but remember those many sessions we had dealing with your struggle with pornography. How are you doing today? Take the initiative to assess the progress and the fact that they are standing resolute in the triumphs that were previously experienced. Then that brings us to Roman numeral four, guidelines for dismissal. And I have again a couple of introductory perspective things to say. I underscore again the privilege it is to carry out our pastoral counseling in the context of a biblical church. Unlike the professional counselor who takes on his clients with no deep previous relationship, knowledge, and interaction, we never view our session or sessions as anything other than as part of our overall pastoral interactions with our people. And we come to those sessions surrounded by the dynamics of the shepherd-sheep relationship. And furthermore, when we believe that the issue or issues that precipitated the council have been brought to fundamental resolution, we don't shake the hand of the person or persons, tell them it was good to meet them, and the privilege to help them, and then bid them goodbye. No, we're releasing them back into the normal flow in the life of the church and in their interactions with us. And when we do, our relationship is never the same. As we release them back into the ordinary life and ministry of the church, but as a result of having entering into their problem or problems with them, our love for one another has been deepened. Our mutual knowledge of one another has increased so that the particular sheep whom we've counseled will be better able to fulfill the mandate of 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, and 12. Know them that are over you in the Lord and esteem them very highly in love's sake for their, in love for their works sake. And when you've come out of a counseling session that has been brought to some real progress in resolution, that sheep, those sheep you've counseled, they will be much better able to obey that clear injunction given to all church members and we are better able to express to them the ethos of John 10, 14. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. You've entered in and penetrated more deeply into the wool of that sheep. You've been having your fingers dripping with the lanolin from their wool. You know those sheep better so that biblically mandated shepherd-sheep relationship is greatly deepened and strengthened when they are dismissed from that counseling session. Now consider with me after those introductory perspectives as I take up four categories of dismissal. Four categories of dismissal. Number one, I'm describing as dismissal in triumph. In this case, the behavior pattern or issue that has brought them to the counseling room has been altered and reinforced sufficiently to believe that the purposes of that council have been realized. The principles that should influence our thinking concerning this category 
are deeply embedded in my judgment in no other passage more clearly than 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 5 to 16. I won't take time to read the entire passage, but here was a case, as you remember, of that sinning brother. Paul had to rebuke the church because they had not dealt faithfully with him. But now Titus comes back to Paul with a report, and Paul then expresses his rejoicing that they've been brought to repentance, and he assesses the sincerity of their repentance in the language of verse 11. Behold this selfsame thing, that you were made sorry after a godly sort. What earnest care it wrought in you. What clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging. In everything you approved yourselves to be pure in the matter. That's the key phrase. Paul said, I could not reasonably expect any other tangible evidence that the issues I addressed have been dealt with biblically. And that's what you and I must look for. If we are going to dismiss people from concentrated pastoral counseling, we have every right to expect that we can do so in faith when there's this type of in everything you have proven yourselves to be pure in the matter. That's dismissal in triumph. And this fundamental resolution should lead to joy and thanksgiving on the part of the counselor. I have no greater joy than to hear my children walk in the truth. And there's the good opportunity to bring additional motivational pressure upon that sheep, upon that couple, John, Mary. I can't tell you the joy you've brought to my heart as you've taken the counsel week by week or every other week when we've met for this series of sessions and now you're reporting to me that your marriage is a different kettle of flesh, then say with real tenderness, please don't break my heart by having to call me and say we've gone back to square one. It would break my heart. Open your shepherd's heart and reinforce so that that motive we looked at yesterday and I tried to demonstrate the legitimacy of it. It is a legitimate motive to pursue holiness to please your spiritual overseers. Paul said, if there's any consolation in Christ, etc., fulfill my joy that you be of the same mind one to another. You want to make me a happy apostle? Then do what I'm telling you, and you will increase my spiritual joy. Furthermore, whenever possible, apprise the one who's being dismissed in triumph that with their permission, you will consider sending others to them when similar concerns arise with other sheep in days to come. There's a marvelous principle embedded in 2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 6. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction in order that we, may be able to comfort them that are in any affliction through the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted. While here the specific issue was affliction, difficulties, but the principle behind it is God's deliverance to the afflicted soul becomes the theater within which learning the grace of God, I then can convey to others in similar afflictions what God can do and has done. And Romans 15, 14 to me is very appropriate here. I am persuaded of you, brethren, that you are full of knowledge, full of goodness, able to counsel, nuthetically 
counsel, admonish one another. And this is especially true for people struggling with patterns of addictive sins. They are tempted to despair. Well, you're the preacher, and you're supposed to tell them there's hope in Christ and in the power of the Spirit, and they may believe that. But if you can point them to someone who's been in the muck and the mess that they're in, and they can sit them down and say, look, I was in the muck and the mess you're in, but by the grace of God, I have gone six months and I have not looked at one pornographic image in any way whatsoever. There was a time when I despaired I would never be delivered from its horrible, addictive power. I've cursed the day. The first time I clicked my mouse where I knew I shouldn't, I've cursed the day I ever picked up that magazine off the rack in the store. But I can't go back and undo it. Ever wonder would I ever, ever be delivered? But I can tell you, my brother, there is grace in Jesus Christ. If you're prepared to appropriate your resources in Christ and apply them with spiritual diligence, I'm looking you in the eye and say, by the grace of God, six months and my old bondage has not been able to draw me back into its ways. What an encouragement to a struggling saint. And so I'm urging you that when you can dismiss someone in triumph, never without apprising them. You go to them subsequent or during what is your final session and say, now John, if somebody should come to me with a similar problem, do you have any objection if I commend them to you? Because what I'm now doing is I'm breaking an element of pastoral confidence. This person has never had a clue that John struggled with pornography. So when I say there's someone who struggled where you are, I must do that with their permission. I must not do that unilaterally. But speaking then, and generally, I have rarely found anyone who refused that offer. The thought that they could be part of what Ephesians 4 is talking about, one of the joints which is supplying spiritual nourishment to the body, gives them added motivation to stay straight. If the pastor's going to send someone to me as a monument of someone who got straight, woe be to me in a moment of carelessness and weakness if I go back to the flesh pot. And so you're even strengthening their motive to remain true to the Lord. So there's dismissal in triumph. Now secondly, dismissal due to an impasse. In the course of your counseling sessions with an individual, you may have opened up all the dimensions you know how to address, have given them all the homework you can give them with a good conscience, yet it becomes clear that the issue has not been brought to resolution. What do you then do? Well, if it's a Monday, I know what you'll be tempted to do, <laughs> and in your resignation. Say, so there must be an easier way to honor God and serve His people than to feel like the prophet who said, I've spent my strength for naught. Or like Isaiah said, they have come to the birth and they brought forth nothing but wind. It's one of the most graphic images in all of Bible. A woman goes through a whole period of gestation, has a big belly, gets on the birthing stool, and all she does is breaks wind. You talk about disappointment. Ain't no baby. <laughs> Just a big toot. But I mean, that's in the scriptures, dear brethren. I don't mean in any way to be coarse. That's in the scriptures, and we would feel that way. We've spent ourselves, and yet no resolution. resolution. Well, there's a point at which you'll have to determine to terminate the sessions, but with the assurance you will continue to pray for them, and that God, should he give you further light on the issues that might be used of God, you will take the initiative to contact them. We're considering problems the individual may wrestle with that are not of the nature that warrant escalation to public exposure and to formal church discipline. However, 
you should be aware that some of the causes of an impasse may be, and where appropriate, do some sanctified probing in one of these areas. Number one, they may be covering up sin that is causing a constant grieving of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4, 30 to 32. There may be issues, and this has been a great help to me through the years, which God has simply not yet revealed to you or to them. Philippians 3 and verse 15. I've used this text many, many times in counseling in various ways. Paul, having declared his single-eyed purpose of pressing to the goal, says in verse 15, Let us therefore, as many as are perfect or mature, be thus minded, and if in anything you are otherwise minded, this also shall God reveal to you, only whereunto we've attained by the same rule, let us walk. Paul acknowledges that there is an element of divine sovereignty in the timing of God's dealings with us, bringing us to new insight and to new and further understanding. And so we may be dealing with this kind of thing. The Lord said, I have many things to say unto you, but you are not yet able to bear them, John 16, 12. Thirdly, We may be witnessing aspects of the mystery of God's sovereign will in his dealings with his people, both to the one we are counseling and to those of us who are giving the counsel. What I'm doing now, you do not know. You shall know hereafter. And then 1 Corinthians 3, 7, One sows, another waters, but God gives the increase. And then on page 66 of my good friend Dr. Murray's book, I knew I had it in the pulpit. I didn't know it had been demoted to the floor. He focuses upon this in a very helpful way. He says that the matter of non-resolution, speaking particularly here of depression, may be rooted in the sovereignty of God. One final cause of depression in the Christian is the sovereignty of God. Hard though it may be to accept, the ultimate cause may be it pleased God. This, however, is not some sheer, arbitrary, sadistic, pointless infliction of suffering. Not at all. God has wise and loving motives and purposes in all his dealings with his children. The Westminster Confession of Faith says, God will sometimes allow his children to descend into the depths of depression to discover unto them the hidden strengths of corruption and deceitfulness of their hearts that they may be humbled and to raise them to a more close and constant dependence for their support upon himself, and to make them more watchful against all further occasions of sin, and for sundry other just and holy ends. Sometimes we take God's presence in our lives for granted. We forget we might be without what we might be without him. He may wisely temporarily and proportionately withdraw the sense of his favor and presence to remind us of our state without him and to lead us to greater thankfulness and appreciation for him. He may do this, note carefully now, by acting directly on our feelings, but he may also produce the same effects by lovingly afflicting our brain disrupting its chemistry and electricity, just as he does when he lovingly afflicts one of his dear children with epilepsy or any other disease. And so in dismissing to an impasse, that may not be a matter of defeat. It may be a matter of resignation to the mysterious but sovereign will of God. And then finally, it may be encounter, we may be encountering factors that result from God's chastening of his people 
And as I said yesterday, some of those things, we nor they will have no power to change. 2 Samuel 12, 11 to 14, we focused on the glory of God's grace. I have sinned. The Lord has put away thy sin, nevertheless. And then the announcement of God's fatherly chastisement upon David. And then, of course, the whole teaching of Hebrews 12, 5 to 8. And then I've listed the competent to counsel, pages 56 to 59, addressing other things that might lead to righteous dismissal. And then, very quickly, the last two, dismissal by referral. You may come to the conclusion that you are now in over your head. If so, don't try to bluff it, but acknowledge to the one you are counseling that you need to seek help elsewhere. Acts 11, 24 to 26. Barnabas had come to the conviction, I'm in, quote, over my head to take these people further. They need the insights, the ministry of the Apostle Paul. He seeks him out, he brings them, and the blessing of God continues. You may come to the conclusion that ongoing sessions are simply consuming too much of your time, thereby robbing you of faithfulness to other pastoral duties. You should always be reluctant to come to this conclusion, but there may be times when you have to do this at least periodically and break off a period of time when you do not engage in ongoing counseling with the promise when there is some change in my present pressures and responsibilities, I will contact you, John, and set up another session. Or finally, you may come to the conviction that the root of the person's problem is not primarily a spiritual issue, but a physical one, which needs the ministry of the physician. I can never forget, there was a woman in the church some years ago and when I began to counsel more intensely with her, she would tell me, at the end of the Lord's Day, meeting with God, meeting with His people, I'd be full of joy and of a sense of the Holy Spirit's presence, go to bed in that state, but I'd wake up Monday morning in the pits, oppressed, filled with a sense of guilt, overwhelming paralysis to face my duties. And I finally had to say, my sister, nobody radically backslides in their sleep. I don't know how you can radically backslide in your sleep, but there can be chemical changes going on in your body that are affecting what your brain is telling you and where your emotions are going. I think the time has come for you to have a thorough medical workup. And you may come to that. We're back to where, though Paul knows he's running a risk when he says to Timothy, no longer be a drinker of wine. And I think it's proper to say, oh, I mean of water. No longer be a drinker of water only but take a little wine for your stomach's sake. That left Timothy vulnerable now to abuse wine. But Paul thought the risk was both necessary and wise. And while we recognize the risks, especially in this area where so much is yet elusive and unknown, what is known, in my judgment, does warrant the referral to the physician in some cases. And then there is, fourthly, dismissal to a framework of corrective church discipline. In 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 to 15, is one of the clearest examples of when this happens. In the first epistle, chapter 4, 11 and 12, Paul addresses the matter of laziness. The people of God are to be diligent and work. He says in chapter 5 in verse 14 to all the believers, admonish the disorderly. No changes have been made. By the time he comes to his second letter, verse 6, still no changes made. Then he says, it's time to escalate this to formal public discipline. And likewise, the steps of Matthew 18, 15 to 20, and dealing with certain chronic sinful patterns, brethren, we may have to threaten public exposure 
just like Paul does in 1 Corinthians 5, 9 to 13. I remember an incident years ago. A man was struggling with the sin of bulimia. He would binge and purge, and we'd counsel and counsel some more. And he still would binge and purge. And finally we said, one more incident of this, and we're calling a congregational meeting, and we're going to tell the people, you are walking in a grossly disorderly way. And you're going to be exposed and call the church to pray for you that God will bring you to repentance. Now, as far as I know, though he had many other problems, his bulimia came to an end, as far as I know. So that may be what you have to do at times, dismiss people with the threat of further escalation of discipline hanging over their heads. Well, I got through all that material. You've been patient hanging in here this morning in this first hour and a half or 25 minutes. But I trust I've given you things that will be a helpful, workable model without in any way uh, thinking that this is the only way to approach these matters. But I hope you will find it helpful. Let's pray. Father, we are again thankful that we have your word as a lamp to our feet and a light to our pathway. And whatever I have spoken this morning that has been true to the precepts and principles and to the overarching instruction of Scripture, seal it to our hearts, take the chaff and blow it away, that we may be those blessed men who walk only in your counsel, and then we'll know the blessed fruit of your working in us and through us to the praise of your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.